Can I cover 30 different games in 30 minutes? <laughs> no. Oh, but let's see how long it does take for me to cover my top 30 picks that I'm looking forward to seeing at the Origins Game Fair. Hey there! I'm Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, and welcome to this overview of some of the games that I'm looking forward to seeing at the Origins Game Fair, which takes place from June 12th through 16th this year, where nearly 300 new and newish games are going to be on display, up for sale, and being demoed on the exhibit hall floor. If it's one thing that investigating 300 games at Origins over the course of five days is going to be, it's, it's overwhelming. Whee. So to help better prevent my own mental collapse, I've tried to whittle down my list to just the very top gaming goodness that has caught my eye, and I've managed to get my list down to the 30. So in case you're wondering what's coming up this year too at Origins, I'm going to present this list of my top 30 games, and because I'd rather not talk until my eyes bleed, I'm going to try and keep things succinct with a broad description of the game, followed by what it is about it that captured my interest. So. Let's start the clock, because here comes game number one. Who doesn't love combining robots? I certainly am one who does and am not one who doesn't. Aegis, combining robot strategy game, is the world's best combining robot tabletop game. Actually, says the blurb about that game that they wrote themselves, so... Anyway, using themes from all your favorite giant mechanized robot shows, this game takes elements from other popular tabletop war games and streamlines them to make a game with the same depth of strategy without a high learning curve. So, we'll see if it pulls that off. Players will build teams out of five robots that are going to duke it out against other players' teams of five. Now, this game is designed to be easy to learn, affordable to buy, and quick to play, setting it apart from other strategy games. But it makes me wonder if this game is actually going to be what I'm hoping it is. Uh, there was a game long ago on the Commodore 64 called Mail Order Monsters. Mail Order Monsters is a game that I have long waited for a board game to replicate, and I'm hoping the A just does that, but I kind of think I'm setting myself up for disappointment. Either way, it's still the first one on my list that I'm looking forward to. Number two is Abomination, the Heir of Frankenstein, coming out in 2019. And I guess I should mention at this point that my list is in no particular order other than alphabetical order, which I guess is an order. So my list is, is, is in an order, which is alphabetical order, with number two being Abomination, the Heir of Frankenstein. It's a competitive game of strategic monster building for two to four players, inspired by Mary Shelley's classic novel of gothic horror, Frankenstein. In the game, the creature demands that you help it accomplish what its own creator would not do to bring to life an abomination like itself, a companion to end its miserable solitude. This game sounds like a really fun time. Through worker placement and careful management of decomposing resources, cool, you'll gather materials from the cemeteries and the morgues around the city, again, cool, conduct valuable research at the Academy of Science, hire less than reputable associates, and toil away in your lab, all in an effort to assemble a new form of life and infuse it with a spark of being. Now, I'm not really usually into horror games, but this one kind of caught my eye, and its spark of being premise sparked my curiosity. So that's why I'm willing to give this abomination, morgue-collecting, resource, hoo-ha-ha -ha game a, a chance, and why it's number two on my, well, actually, the reason why it's number two on my list is because the list is in alphabetical order, but it's why it appears on my list in the first place. Number three is Among Thieves, which is a game of deception and greed. In this game, you will work together to extort information from higher level employees of the largest corporations in the world. However, there's a catch, because no one can be trusted. I guess that's why they call it Among, among Thieves. You will have to win by having the most money, and you'll have to also be careful, because the player with the least honor is eliminated. Each round, one player is the heist master, and that heist master is going to choose who to take with them on the heist. Hence, they're mastering, that's why they're the heist. All of the players can offer whatever they want to go on to these heists, but the heist master can accept whatever deal they want, but no promises that they make are binding. 
And once the team has been chosen, the players will simultaneously choose whether to be honorable or dishonorable, and then wackiness ensues. I am a sucker for one of these kind of social bluffing, deduction, hey, we have to argue and come to a conclusion and there's really loose rules to it types of games. These games fall apart and don't work just as often as they do. So we'll see how this one does, but I have, uh, I have strong hopes for uh, Among these. Number four is the new edition of Atlantis Rising. Now, when I first got into hobby board gaming again, back in about 2012, Atlantis Rising had like just gone out of stock and was no longer being printed. So it's long, I mean, since day one, this game has been on my list of games that I wanna track back down. What is it? Well, Atlantis Rising is a cooperative worker placement game in which you must all work together with up to five other players to deploy citizens across your homeland, gathering resources in order to build a cosmic gate that can save your people. Sure. Now this new edition contains all new art and all new graphic design, and it was created to bring even more attention to the thematic setting of the game. There's other changes too that streamline this game, but even without those changes, even if it was a straight up reprint of the first edition of the game, this one would definitely, definitely be on the list of games that I want to check out at Origins. Number five is Barrage, a game that just at first blush to me, looks like a game that is for people who thought CO2 just wasn't brutal enough. Barrage is a resource management and strategic placement game in which players compete to build their majestic dams, raise them to increase their storing capacity of precious water, and deliver all the potential power through pressure tunnels connected to powerhouse energy turbines. That already sounds like a lot of stuff to do. But wait, there's even more stuff going on in this game. For example, each player represents one of the international companies who are gathering machineries innovative patents and brilliant engineers so that they can claim the best locations to capture and exploit the water power of a contested alpine region crossed by rivers. Oh, that old theme. Barrage includes two innovative and challenging mechanisms, okay? First, you got the construction wheel, which has to be managed by players to carefully plan their actions and handle their machineries, since both your action tokens and resources are stored on the wheel and come back only after a full wheel round of spinning that wheel is completed. So you gotta time that just right, which doesn't sound easy, but could be fun. And the more you construct and perform maintenance on your little wheel, well, the earlier that the resources and the actions are gonna return back to you. So that's a barrage, which just seems like a barrage of mechanisms and things to do, but in its scariness, it, it makes me all the more intrigued. Number six is Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated Upper Management Pack. Woo! Each character in this game comes with a unique deck reflecting their specific talents. So you can use them in the original Clank deck building adventure game or with a franchise established in Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. This game is not only one that I'm looking forward to seeing at Origins, it's one I've actually pre-ordered already and I'm going to be picking up so I know it's following me home. Clank Legacy really, really interests me and so this first introduction to it, this Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated, which is gonna be compatible with it. I'm, I'm scooping that up because I can't wait to use that and everything else in Clank Legacy. Well, everything that, you know what I mean. I'm going on, I'm moving on. Number seven is Conspiracy, The Solomon Gambit. Now in this game, which is a restoration of the 1973 classic game Conspiracy, players vie for control of these various agents by secretly paying them off and using them to move this briefcase across Europe, trying to get it to their headquarters. However, things are not as easy as they seem in the spy game because other players can challenge and stop an agent from moving if they have paid more money than you to the right people. Oh, and for the right price, they can even assassinate another agent. Whoops. In addition to a slick new look, this restored version of the game offers two new twists on the original. First of all, each agent has a unique ability that lets them move an agent or their briefcase for free. Ha, gotcha. Secondly, an alternate win condition eliminates stalling and potential stalemates, which could happen in the older game because the older game is really old. It's a year older than me. That's, games have come a long way in those 36 years. So if no one wins within a certain number of turns, Dr. Solomon can end the game immediately and whoever has paid off the most to him, ha, wins the whole thing. 
However, there's even a wrinkle on the wrinkle, because if you pay off too much to Dr. Solomon early in the game, well, that can leave you with little control over the other agents, forcing you to strike a tricky balance between immediacy and long-term goals. Can Restoration Games hit it out of the park again? Number 8 is Court of the Dead, Mourner's Call. In this game, you are a mourner, an allegiant of death, dedicated to realizing his noble ambition to end the celestial war and restore balance to the very universe. Oh my goodness, have you got a chore list. However, death's purpose includes your own ulterior motives. <laughs> because you and your fellow mourners must unite and rise, or you're all going to just fall together and lose. So. While the underworld is united in its purpose, it's also divided in its strategy to achieve that purpose. I have had my eye on this game for like over a year now, so it's going to be really interesting to finally see it at Origins. And its rating on Board Game Geek is really, really high, so I kind of have some high expectations for this, so I'm looking forward to seeing it come heaven or, or high water. Uh, just no lame jokes, continue on. Number 9 is Die Hard, the Nakatomi Heist board game. Based on my second or third favorite movie of all time. Now, this game uses a one versus many asymmetric gameplay system to pit its protagonist, John McClane, against other th thieves and thief-like entities who are cooperating to foil the hero's plan, which is to save the hostages in the iconic Nakatomi Plaza high-rise building. So it takes place in the same setting as the very first Die Hard movie. The best Die Hard movie. Some may argue, perhaps, canon-wise, the only Die Hard movie which is worth considering to actually be a Die Hard movie. But I digress. Movie buffs and hobby game enthusiasts, that's me, will appreciate the game's distinct homage to the 1988 film, We Will, which packs rules and gameplay to the air vents, whatever, with callbacks to Die Hard's most memorable scenes characters, and events. Please, please let this game be amazing. Number 10, Downfall. Downfall is set in the year 2213, in which the world order, as has been known for a century and a half, came to an abrupt end after a 19-day war. Efficient. Long story short, 90% of the world's population is dead, okay? Wars and conflicts have raged down again for decades prior, populations rising up, and the global government seeking to quell the conflict and maintain the status quo. Is it working? Don't think so. Because in the most recent five-year period, the conflicts have escalated rapidly, and the world order has fallen apart. But now, all that matters is surviving, and if possible, rebuilding. I don't know if this game is going to have flavors of the game This War of Mine from a couple of years ago. Now, are my presumptions about this game even remotely accurate? I have no idea. And that's why it's another one on the list I'm hoping to track down and find out more information about at Origins. Number 11, Draftosaurus. In Draftosaurus, your goal is to design a dino park that's going to attract the most visitors. And to do so, you're going to have to draft little dino meeples and place them in pens that each have different placement restrictions. Each turn, one of the players rolls a dice, and this adds a constraint to which pens any other players can add their dinosaurs to. Draftosaurus is designed to be a quick and light little drafting game in which you don't have a hand of cards that you pass around, but a bunch of dino meeples in the palm of your hand. At first blush, this game actually almost seemed like, like a roll and write without the rolling and without the writing. Almost uh, like Zootopia meets Welcome To, but maybe not at all, which is why I'm going to check it out, and if I'm wrong, I will be ashamed and I, I will tell you of my shame. But hopefully, I'm oh so right. Number 12, Escape Plan. This game takes place after a successful bank heist, in which you and your fellow thieves are laying low and enjoying the good life of being thieves. We. Now, most of the cash that you have stolen away has been hidden away, and the rest has been invested in businesses throughout the city. Everything is going according to plan, but then the police get a breakthrough in their investigation. Whoops. Now, accusations are being made, fingers are being pointed, and after a heated argument, you decide all to go your separate ways. But you're robbers, which means you're jerks, which means you're going to try and get away with the most money while maybe sending your other cohorts up the river. 
Now, the thing that intrigues me about this game is the theme seems really, really interesting. However, it's a Vital Lissarda worker placement game, and I've read that the player interaction is actually very minimal. It's actually just worker placement. So how's that going to work? I don't know, but I'm really, 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 really intrigued to find out how it works. Number 13 is Fire in the Library. Fire in the Library is a press your luck game in which players must try their best to rescue books and accumulate knowledge before it all goes up in smoke. This game is played in rounds of the variable turn order in which earlier players have more risk but higher possible reward. I love games that have that type of back and forth balance. Everything good I do might have something bad that can happen and I gotta find the equilibrium between the two. Very cool. In this game, everyone starts with tools to help mitigate their luck and change the probabilities for their different opponents. In the end, though, players need to hurry as the game immediately ends when one wing of the library completely just burns down. So, you gotta take your chances, be brave, and save as many books as you can from the fire in the library. Oh, I worked the title into the end of that. Bravo. Okay. Number 14, Honga. Honga is an action selection resource management game for two to five players aged eight and up, which is set in the prehistoric time period where saber-tooth cats run amok, eating your fish and your resources. And then one of the neat things about this game is how you do your action selection. Each character has these little circles that have these four different actions that they can take, and depending on the way you rotate it and place your little action disc on the board will change the actions you have available to take that turn. It's really fun. Uh, I played this at the Gamma Trade Show back in March, and for being a kid's game, it's one of those games that had the ability to either be fun and friendly or rather cutthroat, depending on which people you play it with. So that's why I'm looking forward to taking a second look at Honga at Origins. Number 15 is Kibble Scuffle. Kibble Scuffle is a tactical card game of area control to try and get the best food for your feline friends. With cards like the Robovac and Laser Pointer, players can use toys to strategically distract their opponent's cats. Using the game box as a cat food box to store the food cubes in, players will take turns placing their cats and resolving their cats' abilities. Did I mention the game is all about cats? For example, the Pounce Cat removes a cat at a cat bowl. The Greedy Cat eats two food cubes that would have been fed to other cats. And the Mangy Cat forces another cat to move away from their cat bowl, reducing the amount of cat food that cat ingests. How do I win? Well, anytime five cats are at any one food bowl, the feeding, scoring phase begins, followed by a brand new round. And either the game goes on forever, or it eventually ends. And that is my professional opinion. All right, we're halfway through the list, so for the love of everything holy, please subscribe. Number 16 is Legendary Forests. Now in this game, each player creates their own world by connecting the landscapes on their tiles. Each player starts the game with the same starting tile in play. Then one player, the leader, shuffles their tiles face down, then removes five of them from play without looking at any of them. Now on a turn, the leader reveals the next tile, calls out the numbers on it, then everyone places that same tile somewhere in their landscape with the adjacent edges of each pair of the tiles that they need to match. So there's a lot of a puzzly aspect to this game, which I must admit, I must admit can be a nice, you know, for a refreshing break from a lot of the hack and slash and dungeon crawl and miniatures infested games that seem to crop up a lot. You know, every now and then, you just want to sit down with a good puzzle, and I'm hoping that this one turns out to be one of those really good puzzles. Number 17 is Magna Storm. How's this work? Well, when the first exploration vessels entered the cloudy atmosphere of the planet Magna Storm, they discovered not only evidence of abundant natural resources, but also the remains of a long lost civilization. Scout vehicles are then carefully lowered to the barren surface of this planet to search for suitable mining areas so they can take advantage of all of these resources and sup them from the planet's surface. Magna Storm is a big, huge tactical board game with very little luck involved in it. So you're not going to have that Ameritrash experience. You're going to have to use them wits. Clever resource management, logistics, and really good timing while you keep a shrewd eye on the actions of your opponents if you're going to gather those resources and come out ahead. 
At the end of the game, each player receives one of 120 different rewards cards, which can be used then in later games to compensate for varying levels of skill among the players. And that alone is pretty cool because it adds some sort of balance and continuity to ongoing games. Magnastorm seems really interesting for a myriad of different reasons, and that's why it comes in on the list at number 17. And number 18 is Mega City Oceana. Well, in this game, Advances in technology have enabled us to build towering superstructures on immense floating platforms out in the sea. And now you, yes, you, you are the next generation of architects who have been called upon to design and build these marvels of structural engineering. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to race to collect contracts, construct beautiful little buildings, and vie for awards as a unique mega city emerges before you on the tabletop every single time this game is played. Now, I have discovered that I don't necessarily jump at the chance to play a dexterity game. They're all right, but they're not necessarily my favorites. But the reason why this Mega City Oceana is on my list, because it seems to combine that uh, dexterity element with some actual light strategy as you are planning and implementing the city that you're going to build. So, all right, Oceana Mega City, I'll take a look at you. Number 19 is Omicron Protocol, which I think is actually coming out closer to 2020, but it's going to be available for Luxie at Origins. What is it? Well, Omicron Protocol is an intra-apocalyptic, which I guess means the apocalypse is going on right now as you play, which really is not the best timing. But it's also an arena combat miniatures game and rival factions are fighting for the resources that they need to survive in their quarantined and locked down city, San Lazaro. Every character in the game is represented by a detailed 32mm miniature, possessing their own rich history and personality, as well as powerful cybernetic abilities. <laughs> Omnicon Protocol, while being fancy to say, is filled with innovative and unique game mechanisms that make every experience thrilling and exciting, ushering players deeper and deeper into the gripping lore of both San Lazaro and those who fight in its now dangerous streets. At least... That's what its marketing blurb on BGG has to say about it. That's high praise the game is giving to itself. So that's another reason why I'm going to take a look and see if Omnicon Protocol is up to snuff when I see it at Origins. Number 20, <laughs> number 20 is One Key. Okay, this is a game that I have had like several near misses with since like March. I have been trying to track down and see and play this game, but so far it thus eludes me. Here's what it's about. In this game, the key is missing, and it's up to the players to find it. The team leader tries to communicate with the other players, proposing clues by indicating their degree of affinity, either strong, medium, or weak affinity, with objects that the team must find. So, you're going to have to use really good team play while the other players remove the wrong cards step by step until the key is all that remains on the table. Removing the key, though, results in instant defeat, kind of like finding a spy in code names. Code names. Code names is the name of that game. And speaking of code names, that's why this game is on my list. From what I've read about it, it really gives me a code names vibes, and I'm hoping that it follows through on that. Sometimes you're really eager to play a game, and sometimes you just want to see it played to find out what in the world this thing is all about. And thus is the case with number 21 on my list, Palm Trees. Palm Trees comes with 78 cards that represent fronds and coconuts. And then all of those cards have crazy rules on them telling you how you have to hold them in your hand. Uh, between your thumb and your pinky, or in your palm and index finger only, or you can't touch other cards with that card and stuff like that. It's like twister in your hand. So what you want to do is you want to pick challenging cards for your opponent and hope then that they drop all their cards on the table, leaving you the palm tree winner with the win in the palm of your hand. Oh, that's what I should have said. The win in the palm of your hand. Pretend, pretend that's what I said. And yeah, I, I, I gotta be honest, palm trees is not on my list because I am really looking forward to playing it. I just, it's one of those games I just want to see it happen just once. So there it is. Number 21, palm trees. Number 22 is Sierra West, which is on my list because I want to get a closer look at it at Origins. Uh, during the Gamma trade show back in March, 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 
Back in March at the Gamma Trade Show, I saw Jonathan Cox from the John Gets Games YouTube channel playing this during the kind of publisher demo night, and it looked really intriguing from across the room. So now I want to get up close and personal with Sierra West to really see if it's as fun as John made it seem when he inevitably, of course, won the game, because that's what he does when you play a game against him, he apparently wins. Good job, John. I'm really proud of you for winning all the games. And so, oh, and speaking of games, well, what is the game Sierra West all about? In the game Sierra West, you are an expedition leader who must guide a party of rough and ready pioneers, employing a clever mix of strategy and tactics with every step you take and every breath you make. Sure. Sierra West comes with four sets of special cards and parts, each of which can be combined with the game's basic components to create a unique mode of play, and that's what it is about this game that really caught my attention. During setup, the players choose a mode and then build a mountain of overlapping cards with the corresponding deck that they have. Now, each mode adds new thematic content, alternate paths to victory, and an interesting twist to the core mechanisms. Number 23 is Silver, which I got really excited about after hearing Marty and Tony from the Rolling Dice and Taking Names podcast talk about it on their show. Silver is a fast and engaging little card game with a werewolf twist. Wow! That was not the best description in the world of this game. From my understanding, a better description is that this game is somewhat like a traditional card game called Golf, except it adds a few more twists, wrinkles, and mechanisms to it. Regardless of the quality of the description that I just gave you, the point is that I know that when Marty and Tony played this for their review of it on their podcast, they said they played it like for over and over and over again for like two hours straight. And from what I know about them, if there's a game that can hold their attention for that long, it's definitely worth, worth checking out. I am, I am not a good friend. Number 24, Someone Has Died, which may actually be a holdover from 2016 that's being shown at Origins again this year, but this is a game that I, to date, have not even heard of, so it's new to me. What is this game about? Well, Someone Has Died is an improvisational storytelling game set at a will arbitration meeting where players try to convince an estate keeper that they are the most worthy of someone's fortune. Identity, relationship, and backstory cards help players create wacky characters who must argue against one another for the riches and glory that are going to be given out to someone. Now, I will admit, I will probably play this game once. But I want to try it at least once. It reminds me a little bit of uh, that game I, Dark Overlord, which I really enjoyed playing once. And then once was enough. So. Someone has just died. These type of games that kind of force this sort of storytelling, take that action, are usually fun to play once, like I, I said. However, I am curious enough about it to see if it adds any twists to that genre that uh, I want to try it out at Origins, and um, that may be the first and last time I play it. I don't know. Number 25 is Tales of Glory. Tales of Glory underscores the point that all heroes need to prove their worth. That's right, Tales of Glory. In this game, players are emerging heroes, new to the scene with fresh faces and a naive outlook on life. Wonderful. Each turn represents a year in those heroes' lives, and each player decides what their hero has done that year, like defeating a monster, looting a treasure, meeting people, and other stuff that heroes typically do. They do those things to gain glory. And then, after 10 turns, the player with the most glory wins. So what's neat about this is you're building the life story of this hero from novice to professional wise veteran. Now, some quests, such as slaying monsters, bring immediate glory points, while others are affected by what players have done prior to or afterwards in their path of life. So there's a little bit of sequencing that goes on along with it. While being a lot less than a dungeon crawl and a little bit more than a storytelling game, Tales of Glory still has enough to it that I want to try it out and, and see if this game really has a lot of substance to it or if it's going to just be, you know, laying cards on the table. But that's why it's on my list at number 25. Oh, number 26 actually looks really interesting. Usurp the King. The King may be in trouble. The court that surrounds him contains subjects who seek power. And so each player represents a family that will vie for control over the different subjects of the land. This game features seven different victory conditions. 
seven different victory conditions. So the path to victory may shift as you play, and you gain more information about each subject's motives and what else During the game, your allegiances will twist and change based on your interests, and the subjects are but pawns in the whole scheme of things. I have not seen very much artwork about this game other than the box cover, um, so I kind of have a preconceived idea of what this game is about, and that can actually be dangerous because if the game actually matches what you have in mind, well, boom, oh, it blows you away. But if it's completely different and has a completely different set of mechanisms, well, it's a really good chance it's gonna leave you really, really disappointed. However, Usurp the King does sound interesting enough that I'm really looking forward to giving this one a try. Number 27 is Vinyl. Vinyl is a game where players are aspiring vinyl collectors. You know, vinyl, those big flat black LPs that my daughter wouldn't recognize if I waved one in front of her face. Now, these vinyl collectors, completely unlike board game enthusiasts, have some knowledge of the, what they would like to collect, but then immediately get immersed in the experience and get distracted. Players then will acquire morsels of information, and, and that information will lead them to different vinyl bins where they will select albums to add and expand their collection. Now these albums can be played at the listening booth to increase the value of a player's collection and their ability to collect even more albums. Ho 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 ho! Collecting stuff. But unfortunately, inventory is limited and the other customers may be targeting the very same vinyl gems as you. So as you play this game, you gotta take that into consideration as well. So to recap, players of this game like a thing, want more of that thing, don't know exactly what of that thing is out there, but are willing to collect and collect to get as much of that thing as absolutely possible. Yeah, there's, there's, there's something about this game that seems very, very familiar. Number 28, we need to talk. We Need to Talk is a game in which players take turns being the focus of an intervention by drawing a problem card with a nonsensical problem like uncontrollable interpretive dance or neurotic inability to turn right. Friends will give obscure clues and hints at what the problem is without giving it away completely. And the sooner the intervened can guess what their problem is, well, the more points they'll score. We Need to Talk sounds like one of those typical pre-existing party games that someone has made an official version of now and has packaged for sale. And it's also one of those games that I don't know how often I will find the need to play it after playing it once, but Sounds interesting enough, and I want to see if it has any twists and wrinkles incorporated that I wanted to check it out at Origins as well. Number 29, I confess, is on my list primarily just for the name of the game, which is Winner Winner Chicken Dinner. In this game, players take on the role of foxes trying to steal as many chickens as they can from the hen house and then cook them up into delicious fried chicken dinners. Now each character's fox that they play has a unique ability that can be used once throughout the game, giving them a little bit of player asymmetry. <laughs> or asymmetry, if you want to pronounce it the right way. Continuing on, players will roll dice to steal chickens from the coop. <laughs> collect, collect action, you know what, you've made it this far in the video, I'm going to reward you by, by just, I'm going to keep going. Players steal chickens from the coop collect action cards to help themselves or hinder others, and convert their chickens into dinner. But, ho ho, watch out foxes, watch out for Toby the farm dog, exclamation point, because rolling poorly too many times, he might scare the chickens out of your bag, which would end the game. And no chicken dinner for you, sorry. Action cards can be used to steal from other players, influence dice rolls, and more. The player who has the most fried chicken dinners and chickens in their bag at the end of the game is one lucky fox and the winner. That went perfect. So let's continue on to number 30, the last game on the list, Wordsmith. Now I love a good word game. Boggle is still, I would say, not necessarily on my top 100 favorite games of all time, but probably my top 150, and it is somewhere on these shelves still. It's right here. Ta-da! But this is not the game I'm talking about right now. I am talking about Wordsmith. How does Wordsmith work? Well, in this game, all players create words simultaneously from their letter pieces that they're gonna have on the table out in front of them. Now, each word can only be made and scored once. So there's a thrilling little challenge of word discovery that starts to happen. 
Which words will you discover in your little letter pieces that you have available in front of you? Who knows? I don't because I haven't played the game yet. And as if that wasn't enough of a twist, there's also another little wrinkle that although you can discard letter pieces to make a word, you get bonus points when you can limit the number of pieces that you have to discard, which is a very, very clunky way of saying you score more points the fewer pieces that you lose. So there you have it. 30 games that I'm looking forward to seeing, trying out, and perhaps coming home with from the Origins Game Fair. Now of all of these games, which ones are on your radar? And which games are on your lists that I completely overlooked? There's at least 267 more of them out there. So let me know what you think in the comments below. And until next time, take care.